We are in Clarksville, New York, in the home of Charles Mason. He served in the Army Air Force from January 27, 1943 through November 28, 1945. This interview is conducted by Kenneth and June Hunter on August 7, 2007. What is your full name and when and where were you born? Charles I. Mason, M-A-S-O-N. I was born in Blaisdell, New York, very close to Buffalo. And when were you born? February 25th, 1919. What did you do before you entered the military service? After college, I went to work for the state of New York in the conservation department, working with wildlife, something I enjoyed as a youngster always, hunting and fishing and the like. Where did you go to college? Cornell, which fortunately I just started a course a couple of years before, concentrating in these areas. And did you enlist in the service? Say again? Did you enlist in the service? Yes, I thought I would have a better choice that way and saw no reason to wait for drafting. And where did you enlist? Albany, New York. And then where did you go after? For basic training. For the basic. Well, when they finally got pulled into the service, they had a waiting list, so to speak. Uh, we entered the service at a temporary setup in Atlantic City, New Jersey, where they were trying to handle an influx larger than the regular flight schools could handle. We next had a series of assignments while they were sorting us out and sorting out the colleges where the training schools would be going to. We first went to Goldsboro North, Green, Goldsboro, North Carolina to find better weather conditions than Atlantic City had at the time, then to a college training detachment at Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, then to the Army Air Force Classification Center at Nashville, Tennessee, then to the equivalent of the West Point for the Army Air Corps at Montgomery, Alabama, then to flight school in Tennessee, which I did not complete, but instead was sent on to aerial gunnery school for a short time until the next class of aerial navigation opened up. We spent a long and rather very interesting program there, learning the fineries of navigation some of which dated back, not to change from the days of a Columbus, where the sex were used in Octon, a little different graduation, but basically the same instrument for recording celestial bodies and finding your position in various parts of the world. Fascinating, I found. Or using a more modern equivalent, or not equivalent, but a the E6B computer, which uh, has all manner of quick calculations for helping and finding where you are or where you want to be. Unfortunately, uh, the celestial navigation was extremely important for long distance flights. But when I finally, if I can break sequence, when I finally got to England, the first thing they said is turn in your instruments. You won't need them here. We're going to be doing low level, overland, and the traditional navigation will be suitable, which made me wince a little bit because some of the very capable folks who hadn't mastered aerial navigation had washed out of school. They could have served just as well as I in that theater. But to get back to my sequence, after we completed navigation school and was commissioned, we next had to be assigned to a cruise if you were not a single pilot. And we worked together for 
quite a few months learning to fly as a group and depending on each other to do their jobs. This was out of southern states, night and day missions. Fascinating, challenging, but we managed to squeeze through it. After we had completed that, we were next assigned to our overseas assignment. Fortunately, we had done quite well in training as a team, and we were selected to deliver a new bomber to England. So we went up to Kearney, Nebraska, picked up the plane, uh, corrected the instruments to uh, be sure they would be accurate enough, and took off for Europe. But by that time, there was a heavy traffic load of planes going there. Incidentally, in addition to extra gas tanks, for overseas travel. We also had a few bags of mail for Birmingham, England, so we had a multiple mission there. And we flew the plane up to Goose Bay, Labrador, with a few navigation lapses while I recorded beaver park colonies in great numbers along the way, just in case I had a chance to get back there after the war and beaver season. We had to wait a couple of days at Gander, Newfoundland, uh, Groups Bay, Labrador. Gander was our alternate until traffic cleared a bit. And then they sent us on to Iceland. Traffic was so bad beyond that. Actually, we had to wait about six days before we were cleared to go on to England from there, which was interesting. Almost 24 hours of daylight, and I hadn't. Uh, been in the Arctic zone in summer time before. A chance to check, check out some of the volcanoes and glaciers while we were there. But eventually we had to go back to work and flew on to England, landing in Wales. And there again we had to have a new training program to adjust our procedures to English navigation and control towers and Germany anti-procedures that we had to avoid, and communication was much different down there, over there. And we had to wait for one other thing I had never suspected. Some of the Army Air Force psychologists had a theory that uh, morale would be better at the bases if the meals were always full or the chairs were always full at dinner time. So we had to wait to be assigned to an, a agent, or an a airfield that had lost some folks. And so we moved into their chairs for the first start. Uh, then we had to do some training to show we could actually fly following the procedures that we have in England at the time, which had been proven by many years of British involvement in war over there. One of my first missions was really not even a standard mission. Uh, I had arrived shortly after we had invaded Europe successfully. And our troops were pretty well pinned down in some of the hedgerow country. So our mission was to fly 500-pound bombs to dig bomb holes, uh, bomb shelters for our troops as they moved in after we had vacated the Germans by the 500-pound 500 500 bombs. Uh, not really a tough mission, but interesting to start out with. Then we had a few routine missions hitting military targets in Germany. And one of note was we would often uh, bring on brand new folks on their first missions, and they'd fill in one of your jobs. And this particular mission, we had a green bombardier flying his first mission, who traditionally had a job of after bombs away, most of his work was over, and his job was to uh, call roll call every five, two or three minutes to be sure that everyone was still operating. And uh, in the excitement of his first mission, he forgot about that. 
uh, unfortunately, one piece of the aerial flak had cut my oxygen mask to almost off, not quite. I was still getting oxygen, still alive, but I was passed out. My log just dribbled off to nothing. About 10 minutes later, he realized or someone reminded him and he started checking. And with a quick tape, I started writing in my log. <laughs> it was one of those interesting things. So fortunately, it had no great harm to anyone. I'm sure he didn't forget it, if ever, when he got to his crew. Was the next interesting, quite an unusual mission was to hit the coast of the Baltic where the Germans were working on atomic work. Von Braun was in charge, and they had an underground laboratory and factory. It was quite, it was quite indistinguishable. You had to almost work by instinct to find a bomb point. And apparently, none of us did very well. Their work continued, we learned. Next thing I knew, Von Rahm was working for us after the war, helping in our program. He ad adapted very well and produced very well for us. Perhaps the next mission of mich a note was when I got shot down a few missions later on a, almost a decoy mission to draw fighters, which we were very successful in doing. Some 40 German Falk Wolves worked us over pretty well. In my particular unit, lost seven planes Nine men to a plane, you can figure out what a jolt. What kind of aircraft was it? B-17. A very fine ship and pretty just. The B-24 carried more weight, but they flew a little lower and couldn't take quite as much bomb damage. And I didn't think they were quite as pretty. I thought our plane was pretty highly evolved. It did everything very well. But at any rate, uh, in the air battle, we took quite a little damage. We lost a couple engines. We had a wing fire. And uh, one of the Fock Wolves was enjoying the view. He came to a slow match with our plane flight and was just admiring us. And of course, Fock Wolves was highly uh, safeguarded for the pilot. They had bulletproof glass and metal throughout the entire cockpit. So on my play, on my uh, 50 caliber, I concentrated on the engine area, which was not guarded. And I was rewarded by watching two or three streams of oil coming up and just heading for the windshield. And I was expecting him to have to bail out when he could no longer see his windshield would be oiled up. But that was interrupted by the bailout when the pilot realized that the flames were getting very close to our main wing tanks. So I opened the escape uh, door, bailed out at the first out of the plane, and delayed only slightly my opening of the chute to get some oxygen at least. Why did you have to delay opening? Uh Again, at five miles up, there was very, very little oxygen. You would automatically pass out, hopefully not permanently, but uh, you wouldn't be conscious very long up there. So you have to fall rather rapidly into a denser area with more oxygen. At that point, I was, when I did open the chute, I was a little shocked to pass a piece of silk fabric charred from someone who was less fortunate than I when they opened the chute and it had caught fire. Obviously, a safe landing would not have been in order. Uh, I did have a fighter, pilot, fighter, a German fighter pilot look me over pretty carefully before returning to his assignment. My next concern was, where do I land? And Germany has, at that point, north of Berlin, there was a lot of reforestation and I could see a very large forest that I wanted to hit the edge of because it would be more opportunity for evasion. 
Unfortunately, our parachutes at that time were not as maneuverable as the, the ones we have nowadays. All you can do is pull a shroud line and spill some of your air. And I kept doing that gently and moving further close to the woods, particularly to an angle I wanted to hit, have opening. But uh, I wasn't moving fast enough, so I hit it even harder, and half of my chute collapsed. I landed quite hard. But by that time, uh, it was not a friendly country. There were a lot of folks from, from home troops searching for those who had parachuted in the area previously with trained dogs. I did try to hide my parachute under the leaves and I could see the dogs coming closer and the people, so I climbed a tree hoping that they weren't well trained on nosing people out, but they were very successful. The next thing I had a gun and an invitation to come down down. I managed to destroy some of my escape photographs and the like before I got to the city where I was going to be interned or in, held for the main German forces. And shortly after that, uh, a German flight lieutenant, uh, high ranking individual with a corporal interrogator who spoke English to find out whether his fighters had shot me down or whether the German girl flat gunners, he just wanted credit where credit was due. I didn't want credit for anything. On the way down, I'd taken off my navigator's wings and thrown them away. I still was obviously an officer, but I didn't want them to know what rank, what position I had, because presumably we'd be investigated or interrogated more for up-to-date information. Obviously, we didn't give him any information, and we parted friends, but uh, cordially, but with no information exchange. The next day, or possibly the day after, a bus arrived to take us to our interrogation camp, which was near Frankfurt in southern Germany. On the day before I was shot down, we had a briefing that uh, 80% of Berlin was smashed, destroyed by bombs. As I rode through with a truck in the back, I estimated closer to 92%. It was even more smashed up than I had believed. We drove by a Berlin airport where I was a little shocked to see two or three British, uh, American and British planes that had been shot down and restored so that they were using and bombing missions. Sometimes that they would bring the B-26 or B-17 or what have you to the edge of a formation and correct the anti-aircraft fire on the actual planes bombing. I hadn't heard about that. I was quite shocked. And also they could better determine, the Germans could better determine what our capabilities was what our limitations were by having these planes for their investigators. We were next put on a German train and headed further south for the interrogation center near Frankfurt, where we were marched to our interrogation center. At that time, a, a lady should I say a German woman, stepped out of the crowd. They were not happy. They had been bombed the night before by the British. And she said, for mine fear, and shot the guy ahead of me in the shoulder. Apparently that was an old uh, shell. It didn't hurt him badly. He didn't break stride. He didn't blinch. He continued on. Uh, he made his point quite well, I thought. About that time when we departed on a local bus, I managed to find a German penny. And when I was 
driver was distracted, distracted, I filched a German note out of the money box, just a souvenir I have kind of around here somewhere. But uh, at the interrogation center, uh, they made a point that the injured folks would be treated as soon as they were finished answering questions. Uh, I had been briefed earlier that uh, they had to get you out of there. Time was against them, so I told them nothing, and they had no idea what position I had. So, in short order, I was on my way. What kind of questions did they ask? What was your mission? What was your bomb load? Uh, you, what time was your scheduled bomb drop? And what had you been told about our planes and the limitations? What they did best, what they did poorly, just anything they could we could help and briefing their folks on future missions when my successors came in. Uh, we next moved on a few miles to a camp where they would classify us and assign us to various POW camps. Rather surprisingly, I had to retrace almost my entire trip down and ended up further north of Berlin along the Baltic at uh, Barth, number one POW camp for flying officers, which included British and uh, even had some Russian fighter pilots that had been captured. Their conditions were in turn, well, conformed to Geneva Convention. Uh, not friendly, but uh, not hostile. The Red Cross food parcels were more than adequate, and the German supplies were limited, but not needed really. A lot of the meat would have shrapnel in it, apparently from bomb bursts from killed from aerial raids or what have you, or from ground missions. But uh, basically, a lot of vegetables delivered by oxen and wooden carts, along with the black bread and all the whatever they were giving us at the time. Very shortly, the Red Cross parcels started becoming more scarce, and one parcel would serve two people, later would be more. At the same time, my barracks room was getting filled up more and more. We started out with only a dozen people. Before we, uh, before we were liberated, we had 20 people in that room, and not even enough beds for all of them. Some of them had to sleep on the floor. But uh, with the advance of the war, and more and more Germany being destructed or badly impaired, I guess everyone was having difficulty. At the time, uh, we were not supposed to have allies. We were not supposed to try to escape. It was too complicated a procedure. Uh, they had a very effective wall to wall, well, several layers of uh, interdiction uh, wire, as well as some underground stuff in the guard towers, continually manned. Moreover, uh, there's no point of having people getting shot who had no business trying to get out if they didn't have the skills and the knowledge to give them a fighting chance and had been in camp long enough so that they had a message to give to the allies that they did make it. Uh, you were assigned to a secondary jobs, one of which was uh, delivering dirt from the tunnels. Uh, we had the tunnels hidden underground, of course, under the barracks. And uh, the most people, like myself, greenhorns, do, would be to tuck the trousers with string and you'd start out walking with several pounds of dirt, and you'd keep pulling the strings to release the dirt as you went along, particularly where the guard towers couldn't spot you too well. 
wasn't much, but you do what you can. The barracks were by then badly overcrowded. They had quit building barracks. They didn't have labor. They didn't have wood. They had more important concerns. I'm losing my train of thought, obviously. But uh, what was the day? What was the daily activity like? When was Reveille? What did you have to do? Did they have uh, uh, a checkoff list to see who was still there? Um, you had several times daily. You had a yard lineup in which everybody was in straight rows, and we had front folks counting. Einstein, Dreifier, Fump, Sieg. We had others circulating in the back. We had folks searching all barracks with dogs. And so you were pretty well accounted for. About the best you could do was if you had a ma missing person, as soon as they counted one row, the back man would definitely jump over to the next row and be get his count there. Sometimes they were detected, sometimes they wouldn't. Uh, as POWs, our job was to make it as tough for the Germans as we could without getting killed. Consequently, we were slow in reacting. We didn't, under officers, our own officers' orders, we did what we thought we could without open rebellion. Every now and then, apparently, we were getting too unruly, and the German I don't recall the name of the troops, but they come in with their stormtroopers, jet black uniforms, SS. guns at the ready, dogs, not just guard dogs, but dogs looking for an excuse. And uh, we quieted down for a while. But they had other, other places to use them, so they didn't leave them continually in camp. As uh, the war was winding down, as Berlin was under intense siege by the Russians, our own camp commandant, German commandant, invited us to march out to the west with his troops, as opposed to being exposed to battle. We didn't want to do that. In effect, we were protecting his troops from gunfire, aerial gunfire. So our officers said, we don't really want to do this. We're going to stay. By that time, the Russians were a secondary military wave of Russians were moving along the coastline and getting closer to camp. So one night, the Germans, one evening, the Germans had a final meal for themselves, departed. We didn't have to use the Red Cross armbands that had been supplied in case we were marched out. And the next morning, our own men were in the guard towers. The Russian troops were all around us. And the German commandant said, you're free. Trash the camp, or whatever his words for it. And I think I have a newspaper we produced very shortly, Ruski Comes, in stories of it. Incidentally, speaking of newspapers, the Germans had a rather poor propaganda newspaper that they published about once a month, which really didn't change anybody's minds, and they were almost too gentle. The only problem I had with them, I was keeping up with the advances as they were reported to us as the Allied troops moved forward in mapping it. But we also had a radio in camp hidden in the, in the wall, tuned with a bent nail that appeared to be normal. So I almost knew, you know, even briefly, uh, that we were far further along than the Germans were admitting. So I had to keep my plotting in line with the Germans so that they wouldn't have proof that we were getting information. But at any rate, when the Russians came, we looked to be liberated very shortly, and a few army jeeps did come in to investigate how things were going. But for military reasons that were never made clear to us, we 
waited 12 days before we were cleared by the Russians to leave. In the meantime, the Russians even sent us in their equivalent of a USO troop. And uh, we had taken over the town, more or less, and found a warehouse half full of Red Cross parcels that had never been distributed. Apparently, some Russians, Earth's Germans, had been using them. We also set up a barbecue with cattle coming in on foot and leaving on a barbecue while we were waiting to get permission to leave. Finally, on the 12th of May, I got the word that uh, we were going to be evacuated by bomber in a bomber squadron. B-17s flew into the nearby airport, and we were flown back to an interrogation center in hospital of sorts in France at Camp Lucky Strike, where we were given first aid, so to speak, and uniforms and the like, and starting on rehabilitation. How many people were in your camp? Do you have any idea? How many people were in your POW and your camp? Line? Quite a few thousand. Oh, that many. Behind barbed wire by Morris it's Roy. Our, printed on our camp. Mm -hmm. Actually, and we do, wouldn't have known that because each barracks worked as a unit, pretty much. Incidentally, we had the good fortune to have at least two visits to a shower in the all the time I was there. Mm. But that was in cold weather, frost, icicles hanging down from the ceiling, uh, cold water to get us wet, a few moments of hot water, and then cold water to wash us off again. I think I may have had a, one more opportunity to go. Of course, we'll march there and back to our camp, to our dorm, but it really wasn't worth it. We did have some water and two bathrooms, primitive bathrooms in our barracks. For the, we were locked up at night, of course, they had no choice. And part of the time, before Christmas, we had only one bathroom, we converted one to a still, and we'd taken some of the fruits that we had and had enough for a small celebration that holiday time, and then we had two bathrooms again. Now what about, uh, how were you fed? What was some of the food that the Red Cross provided, and then you said later on the Germans? The Red Cross okay. parcels were well designed, pretty well balanced. Uh, dried milk in a tin container, uh, sugar, dried coffee, uh, Cigarettes, uh, chocolate. Yeah. Uh. Cigarettes were very important, particularly to me, because they, they were only a medium of exchange in the camp. We had no money. And so I immediately quit smoking and took my allocation that I could swap for D-bars. And I always kept a few of the chocolate Red Cross D-bars in case I had the good fortune to be one of the escapees, official escapees. And that's what you would really need for that, for immediate food. What about clothing? What kind of clothing did you use your own uniforms? Did they ended up in rags, or did they uh, have you change into a special prisoner's uniform? No, they didn't want us in uniform, but uh, some folks came down without any shoes, for instance. They just had flying boots. What? They lost those when they opened their chute and suddenly slowed down. And some of those had to wait for literally weeks before the Red Cross could supply shoes. The Red Cross didn't supply army uniforms, at least U.S. armies. And I think probably the British did similar through the Red Cross. But all of those things came to a halt, gradually dribbled away. So by the time we were released, we weren't ready for uniform. What about uh, your bedding? It was uh, straw and wood chips in a burlap container. Uh, 
again, I have a photograph or two showing what they looked like, ramshackle things, uh, almost enough for the people, but not quite as the as the individual rooms filled up. And at the end, I think there's at least two people sleeping on the floor at night. Well, change signals. Uh, lounging in other people's beds during the daytime when there's a poker game going on or meals at the table. But at night, when the tables were out of use, then they could put the so-called sleeping bag on top of that. Uh, incidentally, Whenever there was a nearby air raid, uh, we, of course, were notified by the sirens, and we had to close our windows immediately, and we couldn't travel outside the barracks until the all clear was sounded. And at night, the same thing, of course. And at night, uh, you were particularly unwelcome because the guards and dogs were working. Uh, barracks were about three foot high on piers, which means the dogs were circulating underneath. Incidentally, I guess the security isn't being breached to say that our individual rooms had a stove with a brick base, which we were able to alter. Now, I assume you had an identification card from the, in, in the camp that they uh, got certain information from and I understand you had a co you have a copy uh, that um, you keep for a souvenir. No, this is when we the Russians took over and we were free to travel as long as we were not countering anything the Russians were doing. We went to the office and obtained all of our records that we had, could, including the records the Germans had made for. Identification with photographs. Okay, would you turn that around so we could see it and get a picture? Hold it up in front of you there. And it, it had the information on there, including the photograph. And they even took, I see, in the right lower right-hand corner, they even had a, a fingerprint to identify you. I imagine everybody was issued one of those. Yes. Now, another thing I know that you had as a souvenir well, you made out of uh, tin cans and uh, cigarette paper that you made notes on, that, uh, that you kept a diary on of there. T tell us a little, a little bit about that. Well, we certainly didn't want anything in here that would be helpful to the Germans, so we kept all the further reference. But we had nothing military in there other than type of plane were shot down in. And, and that looks like a model of what the barracks was like uh, or the prison it's camp? An individual room for 20 people. There was very little walking space, I can assure mm -hmm. you. Everything there is on the cigarette paper the, from the, those days. There, There's and Chesterfields, all gold, and I think you had a Lucky Strike and Camels in there, and, you know, all popular brands from back in those days. And we did put down the names and addresses of roommates, so hopefully we'll get together after the war was over. Have you ever gotten together with any of those people? Have you ever gotten together with those people? Yes, uh, not too many. We had they're mostly scattered folks. My own, incidentally, I didn't mention that all the members of my officer group, pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, and navigator, had reunions and kept in touch. In fact, I'm still waiting for word from my engineer, sergeant, who was scheduled to pass on. I thought he would not survive the last month. My, bomb my bombardier is now in California, and he was keeping track, and I haven't had a chance to reach him to find out. Uh, the engineer's wife was going to notify me. Hopefully, he's still surviving and not too painfully. Incidentally, uh, 
This is a German knife for eating purposes, which I altered for in case I became free. It uh, was intended for mm -hmm. self-defense. I managed to get through three or four shakedowns. I had a special spot in some rubber bands to keep it. I never had to use it, and I'm not sure how well I would have used it. Uh, the hardware, eating hardware, consisted of pot metal, which almost immediately broke, so many of us made our own. When we were issued German soap, we would use fine oak with material, but uh, I didn't bother bringing out anything else. Now, they also apparently had uh, an ID tag situation similar to what uh, the dog tags we had. Uh, this one you have here was a uh, German identified the camp you were in. Yes, and uh, it's perforated so that uh, one would stay with your body, one would stay with the record keepers in case you had the misfortune to... It's a standard German type of thing. Ground troops as well as others used it. But this does have stay like Luft. So it's particularly for us. How did the how was the feeling when the Russians came in and liberated you? How did the Russians treat you? Did they, were you regarded as allies? Were they yes. uh, suspicious of you? Group, though. This was a second tier type of troop. They were not frontline troops. The group that came through my camp area were from Vladivostok, speaking Russian sorts, but a jargon that many Russians apparently could not understand well. Very primitive, cast iron soup kitchens on three legs and uh, primitive communication systems, mostly wire stretched along the street. Uh, they were not friendly to the Germans, understandably. The Russians had suffered terribly from them, and uh, they looted the town of Barth in three stages. The first group came through and had their way, took what they could, wanted, and they were in a rush to move on. They left one colored sash on the windows of the area. Secondary troops came through and took what was left, presumably, and left their marks. And a third wave came through to pick up any scatterings. It was interesting to see their transport systems. Often a German field wagon with a mattress on it, being driven by horses, with a Russian lieutenant on a mattress sitting in the back, maybe smoking a cigarette, and the horses being whipped to high speed as they moved on to the, the next town they were going to live away. But uh, generally they were notified that all the troops that we were officers and most of them would salute us when they saw us and passed us. And we had no difficulty with most of them. A few misunderstandings took place, but very few. Had you lost a lot of weight, or were you ill after your experience? My last military weight was 155 when I went in. When I got to the lucky strike, and a weight was 122. Uh, Actually, we were lucky. There was a German civilian camp not too far away. And when I went to visit that on the first day, a number were dead already. Uh, the walkers were living death and probably didn't make it. But these were disloyal, if you will, Germans, often town officials and the like, who were not happy with the German troops and their actions, or the policies, they just were not in touch.
So they were snatched and they didn't get a chance to protest anymore. I don't hear much about those in the news, but there were a lot of those, I understand. Speaking of camps, there was a great many camps for Americans, mostly for enlisted men. We also had some for internees, people who were trapped in Germany when the war ended, hostilities were declared. And I don't know how they were liberated. We know nothing about that. We had rumors that uh, some of the POWs, after the war we had rumors that some of them were mistreated by the Russians, but uh, I have no official word on that. And by that time, Russia and America were mu pretty much contesting top spots, so I can see why there would be some difficulty. Actually, when we got to the camp, Lucky Strike, we were scheduled to come home by a medium-sized boat when we were in shape to do it. And I had been a pretty good soldier up to that time, but I didn't really want to do that. So several of us called our base in England, and my base was flying out the next day to head home through South America. But another fellow's base was going to be there for a while, so we asked to have a bomber sent over for us. And then we went to the base commandant and said, we're escaping again. We'd like to have passes if we don't mind. We're going anyway. So they gave us permits to go to England and I went back to my base and again declined to go south. I wanted to look over London again. And finally the military sent word out that former POWs wandering around England, if you will come back to headquarters here, we'll send you back by the Queen Elizabeth. And that sounded like a pretty good deal. And particularly since I'd lugged out more than most folks had taken out of camp, and I didn't want to throw it away then on the little boat where I'd have to. So I actually got back before some of my ex-POWs were. But we came back to find the military in disarray here. They were still fighting in the Pacific. Many troops were being transferred there. We were still keeping hospitals in England for the smaller troops. Or in Germany for the smaller number of troops who were there in occupation. We didn't have hospitals here and really enough to handle the sudden influx of troops. Uh, I badly needed dental work. They sent me to Rome Air Base, which was just in the process of being demobilized. And the two dentists I had would try for a while to work on me. When I'd pass out, they'd wait for me to come back. I imagine they had coffee, and they were discussing what they were going to do. They were going to be demobilized, too. So, actually, the military in Atlantic City didn't have facilities enough. For, they just said, go home, find a military outfit nearby, and get your troops, get your service. So. Because of the haphazard medical situation, I went to a civilian dentist and had the work done. Not that the Army couldn't do it, but physically, they were in desperate short supply everywhere. They did offer me an opportunity to join the regular Army with the promise that there probably would be an Army Air Force, or uh, an Air Force separate, but I declined that because I wanted to get back to the job I'd had before. But after that time, I'd been in just a reserve commission uh, as a, everyone who hadn't gone through West Point or one of the service academies. But uh, I did feel an obligation to stay in service. The Army Air Corps out unit at Rome had no real need for a navigator at that time and more navigators. So of all things, I joined an anti-aircraft group, see what the other end of things looked like. 
because we've been hit pretty hard many times overseas. But unfortunately, they had very few people to, with training. I was a battery commander, one of several, and I had never fired the guns. I had one man in out my outfit that had ever fired the guns. But when we went over to Cape Cod for our first summer training program, we did very well. The books were there, the guns were in good shape. And I had a chance to see what the other end of the flex system was like. But after two years and two sessions over there, kind of fun, the wives could come over and physicists occasionally. I was spending more and more time on assignments away from Albany. I had a statewide assignment on turkeys by that time and waterfowl. So I just couldn't continue to make the sessions. So I had to resign again from here, from the military. I have continued interest, inactive interest. For a long time I subscribed to the 8th Air Force magazine, but I had been with the 8th Air Force relatively short time compared to m many folks who had done two or three tours of duty from there and had a lot more friendships. Actually, our, our t team was doing very well uh, in training. We had done quite well as a team, and we were in tra training to be group lead. In fact, I was barracked with the lead navigator, supposedly to pick up more information. That had its benefits uh, when the folks in the barracks didn't make it home. Within hours, some of our things were looted, so to speak. Well, he won't need it again. He would want me to have it. But fortunately, since I had only one roommate who wasn't down that day, everything I owned was sent to St. Louis, and I received a notification later on of my family did what was there, and when I came back, uh, they shipped it to me. So I didn't lose good binoculars and a lot of things, with one exception. Fortunately, they didn't try to take my bicycle, English bicycle. They sold that and put the money in my account. So all in all, my military was fortunate. I was very fortunate. I got through my service without any serious injuries. An awful lot of folks who were still flying when I went down didn't make it. So being able to enter the service, have a pleasant time, learn some more information that I didn't have on navigation, and see a lot of country. I almost lost track of the number of stations I was at now. Uh, I consider that just part of the training and fortunate to have it. Were there any occasions after the service that your navigation skills came into play that, that were helpful to you or to others? Just once I had an opportunity to use some of them, basically the visual and the flight machine. Uh, we had a March snowstorm <clears throat> just well here, but even further score hairy area. And they brought in a National Guard troop from uh, Massachusetts, and I worked with the lead pilot, who was an exceptionally good pilot. He had taken his planes down. When we lost a commercial flight in the Grand Canyon, remember somebody got down too low and just couldn't maneuver out and had to crash land at the bottom. He was the first one to take a helicopter down to the bottom. It had never been tried before, so he was good. And between the two of us, we were able to find and deliver foodstuffs to quite a lot of people. They had other helicopters and other folks who knew the country pretty well, but uh, I think I had just a little edge on finding people. One individual in particular, when we picked up some of the folks who walked out to get help, he was in Bern at the time, and I asked him if he knew how to find his house, but well, he was vague. So I took him there, 
no, 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 that's not it. That's not it. I had the helicopter make a pass. From the other side, he recognized the outhouse <laughs> and accepted the delivery. <laughs> so are you uh, in any military organizations? I know you mentioned you had a, like a, are you in any military organizations today? Or? VFW, American Legion? Any or? of those things? No, I have life support membership in several of them, but I don't have time to I, I get the papers. What about reunions? Well, by now, my group is so decimated, there's practically no one left. A few individuals get together, crews and the like, but it's too late for that. Have you ever revisited any of the places you were in in Europe uh, after the service? No, I wanted to go back. And quite a few of the folks did. By that time, the barracks had been torn down. It was farmland again. Mm -hmm. And they had a tour guide who had been a lieutenant colonel in the German Air Force. So it was a kind of a reunion. And yeah, I got the reports of what they found. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was quite busy here. I built this house on my spare time. Uh, I did get assigned to go to Japan and Korea to collect pheasant eggs to see if we could find a strain of pheasants that might change, that might adapt to our larger farms and machinery. And uh, the next year, Pennsylvania asked if I do the same thing. I'd go over there and set up a program, and farmers would send in their eggs, and they didn't want anything. They were very grateful for what we had done in the war. But I never got a chance to go back to, all right, back up, I didn't make one. But we did go back to one reunion, not to my base, but to visit several of the bases. And uh, the tour had already been set up, so we, they offered to change it to include me, but I didn't want to alter it. And quite a few of the control towers had been preserved and were kind of micro museums of I dare say by now it's less in use, although they did take us to an air show, and there's a museum in England, or in, near London, that does have an awful lot of good things. I just turned down an invitation this week to come back again. I just have too many other things going on. Can you remember where you were when you heard that the war was over in Europe? And when you got back to the States, how were you received by the people back in the States? Overly generous. Yes. Very, very kind. What can we help you with? Although I missed part of it. I was in Montreal on VJ night, one of two Yanks. Uh, we didn't have to buy too many beers. <laughs> but uh, generally the reception was overly kind. Uh, those of us who had contributed very little, uh, I felt that folks like my younger brother who had been banged up in Japan and all the islands and then called back for Korea was under-recognized for what he had done, but we were amply rewarded for our service, more so than I think we deserved. Well, you, you mentioned earlier, before we started the interview, that all of your brothers were in the service. Tell us a little about that, each one of them. Well, my younger brother joined the Marines, I think under pressure. I think he'd been in a fight locally, and he said, to, if you want to fight, join the Marines. And he did. And I don't think he was the best of soldiers for them. Very good with the rifle and the bayonet, but at one time he was accused of accosting an officer which ordinarily would. Uh, fortunately, my brother was in service at the time and represented him. And so the best thing I can say is that when he was discharged, the colonel looking over his record said, he just missed it. At one time, he was within two weeks of winning a good conduct medal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he didn't and you had a brother in the Navy? Pardon? You had a brother in the Navy also? Yeah, he, I missed him by a couple hours in London. His boat had been 
involved in bringing troops into the landing. And my older brother was in running an anti-submarine base in, New in uh, Southampton and ready to push a button of a submarine mm. come in to blow up things. But uh, he resigned and was an old officer of training school, and he closed that out when he, mm. the war was over. So. Okay, well, we thank you very much for sharing your story with us.